Hello, and welcome to lesson three. This is going to be a very brief lesson compared to the first few le first couple of lessons. Um, I'd say on average they'll probably end up being around half an hour, with some of them being longer, some of them being shorter. The first two were long because we had a lot of introductory material to cover and then all of the different strategies for close reading. If you recall, there were quite a few of those. Um, the next week's will be a little bit longer because we have a couple of things to go over there. But this one is really brief because your main focus for this week is developing that reading guide, which will probably take a lot of work. So I don't want to take up too much of your time going over the lecture. However, there's one key thing I ask you to do on that reading guide we haven't covered yet, which is to find some examples of they say statements from the article you do the reading guide for. And so I want to spend this lesson going over what those, what that means, what those they statements are, and why they're important. They're important because they're a key way, a, a great way to do something called synthesis. And synthesis is really the main skill I'm hoping that you'll learn by the end of this critical reading unit. Obviously the main goal is to learn how to do critical reading. But in terms of doing critical reading, if we kind of <clears throat> look at the different aspects of critical reading, the different strategies for critical reading, the different skills required for critical reading, synthesis, I would argue, is the most important one. And it'll help you beyond critical reading. It's a key part of critical reading, but synthesis will help you with your writing and other projects, presentations, group work, all kinds of things in a wide variety of fields. So it's, it's, it's crucial for critical reading, but it's also also crucial for a number of skills in this class and a number of tasks beyond this class. So um, your paper that you'll do a rough draft next week and the final week, the week after that, is going to ask you to do a lot of synthesis. So by asking you to incorporate some they say statements in your reading guide, that's kind of the start of our intro to synthesis. So today we're going to talk about synthesis in relation to they say statements and then we'll build on that with more on synthesis in the next two lectures as well. So you'll really want to pay attention to those parts of the lectures. I mean, you should pay attention to all the lecture, obviously, but really clue in on the when I'm talking about synthesis. So what is synthesis? You've probably heard this word before, maybe in, to, in relation to science or something like that. But, um, and that's a good start. If you think of like photosynthesis, that process, that's almost a good kind of metaphor for what we're going to do for it with reading and writing. But here's a definition from another textbook uh, called From Inquiry to Academic Writing, which um, depending on what teacher you have is probably the textbook you'll have for English 201. And our textbook has a good section on synthesis that we'll read next week. But uh, I wanted to pull this quote because I think it's the best um, definition I've read of synthesis in a textbook and um, as you can see I'm giving credit to my source here so <clears throat> according to this source synthesis is a succinct statement that brings into focus not the central idea of one text but the relationship among different ideas in multiple texts so I tried to read that slowly maybe take a minute and pause this and really think about that but it's a, we're going to break it down and analyze it now. So a succinct statement. Succinct means short, brief, to the point. Um, the word succinct I like to use rather than brief because it indicates that something's not just short but also important and to the point. So a, a short, to the point statement that brings into focus not the central idea of one text. So we're not looking at just one text or even just one idea but the relationship among different ideas in multiple texts. So we're looking at multiple ideas, multiple texts, and the key word there being relationship. The relationship among different ideas in multiple texts. And so this is why it's so important to critical reading. When you do critical reading, you're very rarely reading just one text. I mean, you're reading one text at a time, but you're being asked by your instructor or your project manager or your boss to look at multiple things. 
you know, if, you, if you're doing reading for a class, you have a whole quarter or a whole semester of reading. So how do the ideas and the thing you're currently re reading relate to the ideas and the other things you're reading? Um, <clears throat> and when you write synthesis, you're going to write what we call a synthesis section in your upcoming paper. So when you write a synthesis essay or a synthesis section of an essay, you provide this succinct, succinct statement. It's your job, your mission to bring these ideas together. In other words, you've read several things, not just not just asking what are the different ideas in them, but what are the connections, the relationships between them. Um, bring those together. Um, and, and if you can write a very brief statement of it, a succinct statement of it, that's part of the goal. You learn to do this shortly and quickly so that you're kind of condensing the information for the reader. Um, that you take a lot of information and you very briefly condense that so that the reader sees these connections and these relationships without having to read all those things themselves. That's really the idea of writing a synthesis section or a synthesis essay. And so the reading guide, you're really just focusing on one text. You're definitely looking at different multiple ideas, but one text. With the reading guide you're developing this week, um, but those authors, for all the pieces you have to choose from for this, those authors are um, presenting multiple ideas from different sources. They all bring in, you know, multiple resources. And so they make, they say statements. So by asking you on your reading guide assignment to incorporate, they say statements. I'm asking you to see some examples of other authors doing synthesis. Basically all the reading guides, all the articles you can choose from for the reading guide, they all have synthesis statements or, or sections. And so I'm asking you to kind of investigate, gain an understanding of those examples. And then from there, um, you know, kind of gain an understanding of synthesis so that you can eventually see how to do it in your own essay. And that's why I've asked you to include they they say statements on your reading guide. So now you're probably thinking, what are they say statements? So they say statements are simply statements that they're basically synthesis statements would be the easiest way to put it. The reason I picked this textbook, they say I say, it's to kind of supplement the main textbook. The main textbook, the majority of your reading comes from is ever or is um, the Norton Field Guide to Writing, but as kind of a companion piece, I picked They Say I Say as a companion to that book because of its emphasis on synthesis. They Say I Say, those two phrases in conjunction provide a definition of synthesis. It's looking at what others say, bringing that together than giving your own contribution. That's synthesis. And so this is really a synthesis book. So we won't use it as much as the field guide, but we'll use it pretty extensively. And the thing I like about it is it provides templates. Um, almost kind of like a math equation where you plug in numbers for the variables. This book is filled with templates, and there's even an index of templates at the end of it, where you can kind of plug in your own words into the blanks. <coughs> And, and you're not meant to do that. I mean, you can do that word for word. You don't have to, but it, it's to get you going. It's to help you learn how to write synthesis statements because synthesis statements are hard to write. So this book is filled with templates for they say or synthesis statements. Um, we'll look at a few types here. Um, so like I just said, statements authors use to synthesize different ideas from multiple texts. And now we'll look at a few types here. Um, and the chapter I ask you to read, there's three types. And I think this chapter four is the most important chapter in the book. You know, all the chapters are very helpful. But in terms of the kind of academic writing you're asked to do in college, or even just looking at, you know, an argument that's out there, um, these are the three most typical ways to respond. And so anytime you're asked to write any kind of paper that involves research, you know, when you respond to that research, these are the three common ways. 
So disagree and explain why. Agree but with a difference. Or agree and disagree simultaneously. And so there's different um, templates for each of these. And next week when you write your rough draft, um, you'll be asked to give a synthesis of three of the articles. That's what I ask you to do. And then to respond by picking one of these three ways. So you'll come up with some kind of statement that synthesizes the articles. And then respond to that statement in one of these three ways. Do you disagree? Do you agree? Or both? And when you're talking about a tech topic like technology, like we're talking about in this class, it's a highly complex, very nuanced topic. So it's not simply yes or no. It's not simply agree or disagree. And you really can do both. You can agree with certain parts of what you see and disagree with others. And, and, and through that kind of combination, come up with a very unique, interesting, important statement. Um, and so kind of the idea here, the significance of this, is these statements do not simply agree or disagree with the other ideas. They respond to them, building on the pre-existing conversation. So all the articles we're reading are having a conversation about technology. And if you just simply agree or disagree, you're not really adding anything to that conversation. But if you disagree, then explain why. You might introduce some interesting new important idea. Same thing, instead of just agreeing, agreeing, but adding a slight difference. Again, you can kind of build on what others have already said. Um, and that's obviously true if you, if you both agree and disagree. So um, the idea here, I mean, what we're really getting at when we dig down deep like this is learning how to not just repeat what others say, but to add something to a conversation, which is really what we're supposed to do when we're called to do research. The idea isn't simply to regurgitate what others have said, but to learn what others have said and then to find a way to respond, to provide a unique response. So um, that's what I'm hoping you'll be able to do. You'll read, you know, three or four or more of these pieces on technology, and then your essay in a couple of weeks, you'll be able to pr give your own unique opinion on this topic of technology's influence on our society. And it'll be really good practice. You'll be asked to do this in English 201 um, with a topic of your choosing, and you'll be asked to do it in a lot of other classes in college, especially the social sciences and the humanities. And it will be a good skill for the workplace, too. If your boss gives you a project and he, he or she says, you know, come up with a solution to this problem, well, you have to look at what other people have already done, and odds are what they've done probably wasn't completely effective since you're being given the task. <coughs> so you have to look at what's been done before and come up with something unique and useful. So synthesis helps us see what others have said and then respond with something unique. That's why it's so important. That's why it's so useful both in the classroom and beyond. All right, so for an example this time, we're going to look at just one more game again. Since I went over just one more game in the last lecture, and it's not one of the choices for your reading guide, I thought it would be good to use an example from it. Um, so here's an example of a naysay statement from just one more game. And it's an example of a disagree and explain why statement from those three categories. So here, here's what he says. Although there is a certain utopian appeal to McGonagall's Game for Change model, I worry about the dystopic potential of gamification. So here he's quoting her, he's disagreeing with her, and he's saying why. Um, he's even acknowledging that she has a, a valid point to a certain extent, that there's something appealing about her idea. So if you recall from that article, McGonagall is the author he cites when he's showing kind of the positive, the pros for stupid games. And she argues that games, McGonagall argues that games um, provide a useful model for life with their reward system. And so examples would be like Weight Watchers or Frequent Flyer Miles, you know, like the points you get for using a credit card. Um, those would be some of the examples of her Games for Change model. And... Um, He's using the terms utopian and dystopic, which are opposites. 
to kind of illustrate the problem he sees with her idea. Um, a utopian society is a society where where everything is good, everyone's getting along and things are going great. And so he's saying her idea is really appealing if we live in an ideal society. But he's saying we don't live in an ideal society. And the reality is that companies will exploit this. If we get rewards for achievements in games, companies can find a way to market a, products to us and manipulate us through that. And so, you know, utopian society would be the like you know for religious folks it would be like heaven or paradise or you know a lot of people centuries ago thought communism could provide like an ideal utopian society whereas a dystopian society that's like the hunger games that's like all those things you've probably read that are like the hunger games where everything is bad in the future so he's saying yeah, there's something very positive about McGonagall's idea, but it only really works if you're in an ideal utopian place. Whereas the downside to these stupid games could lead to a very dark, bleak future. And so he's saying, look, I see what she's saying and I see why it's appealing, but my concern is she's not really addressing this issue, which is very worrisome. That makes this a great they say statement, incorporating someone else's research but giving a new perspective. He's saying, hey, McGonagall's got a good point, but have you thought about this? And that's exactly what we're supposed to do with synthesis. He's got his own view of the potential dangers of stupid games, and by quoting this other research, he's able to show the significance of his statement. He's not just agreeing with McGonagall, he's using McGonagall to show why his idea is also important. Not that hers isn't important, but that he's adding something important to this already existing conversation, like I said a few minutes ago. So if you look at the book, it has all those templates, um, and this would fall under the disagree and explain why. And one of the templates I've actually modeled here. So um, if you look at the templates, there's fill in the blanks, and those are the underlying parts. The underlying parts are the fill in the blanks. Um, and then also the author's name is just an X. So I, I filled in McGonagall's name you know, with the X there. So he's really using the template that says, by focusing on blank, X overlooks the deeper problem of blank. And what he's saying is, by focusing on the games for change, McGonagall, by focus, excuse me, he, what he's saying is, by focusing on the games for change model, McGonagall overlooks the deeper problem of gamification. So I, I had to change his wording for it to fit with the template. So it's not word for word, but it's the spirit of this template. It's the same idea that this template's getting at. And so you, you see it in action here. If you're trying to write you know, your paper or a paper for, this, for a class, and you're trying to say you disagree with the author, author and give a reason why, and specifically because there's a concern that author overlooks, this is the template to use. And you don't have to use the template word for word, like Anderson here, the author of Stupid Games, doesn't use it word for word, but you can see how you could get a really good sentence by kind of starting with this model, filling in the blanks, and then revising. And that's how I'm hoping you will use that book. They say, I say, and use the templates to do synthesis statements in your own writing. And we'll go into this in more detail in the next lesson, and the lesson after that as we get closer to your first paper being due. I just want to leave you with one last thing here. Um, I'm hoping that by the end of this unit, in a couple weeks, in your final draft, you'll be able to provide a synthesis statement that kind of encapsulates this whole unit. You're, you're picking an essay now for your um, reading guide, um, and you've already read just one more game, and is Google making us stupid for last week's um, assignment? So you'll have read at least three articles. For your pay upcoming paper, you're supposed to pick three articles. Now you can use those three, but they're not necessarily the most closely related. So you might want to pick you know, one of those and then another two, or you pick whichever three you want. There's about, I think, eight or ten essays to choose from. So pick three of them. And in the first half of your paper, you're supposed to synthesize them and provide a synthesis statement. And in the second half of the paper, you're supposed to respond by pick either agreeing, disagreeing, or both, you know, following the templates and they say, I say. 
so I'm hoping that you'll be able to provide, like the definition of synthesis at the beginning of this lecture said, I'm hoping that you'll be able to provide a s succinct statement where you tie together the ideas from those three different articles. So right now here, I'm going to provide a synthesis statement for the whole unit. It's basically my rationale for how I picked the essays for this unit. Um, and then the catch is, um, it's going to be very general. It's not very good because this is a very broad topic, technology. So we'll look at some more samples like this in the next couple of lessons and we'll get more specific as we go. And then I'm hoping you'll have a very specific statement in your article. You'll start to see how some of the articles are kind of covering more similar things. Some are about cell phones, some of them are about search engines, etc. So you can kind of really pick the three best ones for your essay and have a very good synthesis statement. But I want to give you a general one now just to give you an idea and we'll continue to refine this as we go. So here it is. <clears throat> All of the articles discuss the influence of 21st century advancements in technology on culture and society, with some addressing positive or negative effects or both, but all of them concluding that recent technological developments have an unprecedented level of influence on the world. So again, like I said, very general, but I'm hoping you can see how this statement, as general as it is, works for a synthesis statement for this unit. The thing all the articles have in common is that these recent technological developments, smartphones, stupid games, um, texting, search engines, etc., etc., they have all had some kind of influence on society. Um, some of them talk about positive effects, negative effects, some both. But they all, if they all agree, some of them have very different views, but if they all agree on one thing, it's that this influence it, that this technology has on us is really unprecedented. There's, technology has not had this big of an influence before, and that's what all of these different pieces of technology, whether it's a smartphone or a search engine, that's what they all have in common. And so it's very general, because these articles cover a lot of ground. Um, but like I said, you know, in the next, lex next two lessons, I'll provide a similar statement, and it'll get kind of, the examples will get more specific. And then by picking the three articles for your paper that are the three best for what you're interested in, hopefully you can have a statement like this, but even more specific in your paper. So I wanted to give you this statement at the end of the lesson to kind of think about going forward. As you do your reading guide, you do your, find your they say statements for it, and then moving on from there, kind of have this in the back of your head. So that's it for this lesson. Um, like I said, the main focus for this week is doing that reading guide. I didn't provide a lot in the lecture on the reading guide. My thought is there that you know you did a sample reading guide last week and I took you through it on that lecture. Now you're basically just doing all of the reading guide yourself instead of filling in one. Um, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do, looking to see you know what you come up with. Um, what article you pick and, and what you pull from it for your reading guide. It's going to be interesting for me to read next week, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, have a great weekend, and I look forward to reading your work.